Welcome to Joy News Desk. We are coming to you live from our studios in Kokum Limle on the fan of our streets. We're on DTT because we're free to wear. We're on DSTV channel 421 and Go TV channel 144. Coming up this morning, former chairman of the anti Galamse Committee, Professor Kwabna Frimpong Boateng, says he feels victimized over his invitation by the Office of the Special Prosecutor, which later turned into an arrest. We will take you to the Etiwa Forest, where environmental experts are warning government against the mining of bauxite in that forest reserve in the wake of the devastating effect of illegal mining on Ghana's once rich vegetation. And on our next episode of Potholes Exhibition, we'll take you to the Ashanti region town of Bokrum to show you how damaging the deadly potholes riddled roads have become to both motorists and residents. We have business coming up shortly in this bulletin. My name is Aisha Brian. Do stay for details. <music> Former chairman of the Interministerial Committee on Illegal Mining, Professor Kwabna Frimpong Boatin, says he feels victimized over his invitation by the Office of the Special Prosecutor, which later became an arrest for which he was granted a two million Ghana city bill. He says he was surprised by the treatment meted out to him, giving his selfless contributions to the country. Speaking in an exclusive interview with Joy News on the back of reports of his arrest and subsequent release two weeks ago by the special prosecutor the revered heart surgeon recounted his experience we vegetated the that field if we had planted cocoa it would have been yielding fruits by now after three four years so you might you saw that you go there and you, you find pits you know freshly dug pits and gullies and so on this happened four years ago the place was uh, cleared, vegetated, and so what I'm saying is that it happened. So that's what I, I, I say for I now. I ask that because the traditional authorities sent journalists there to verify the claim, and and, I don't, and as we go along in life in this country, others who uh, have the power now or who have the influence now should know that at some point they should also uh, they will hear that character for what they are doing. Do you feel you're being victimized? I think so. Why do you what, think what so? What have I done wrong in this country? If 0.001% if of people behave like what I've done, this country will not be the way it is. I mean, look, I bought a whole hospital, trained people, Ghanaians, heart surgeons, trained people from Nigeria, Ethiopia, you know, uh, changed Kolebu uh, after Gorgesberg and Nkrumah. Rimpo Boatin was the person who, who added structures and systems to Kolebu, you know, with internally generated funds, not money from the government. You know, I changed uh, the way Ghana Red Cross functioned. Uh, as chairman of the PIC, I did a lot for this country. You know, and as minister, I introduced a lot of things. If I pursue them, who have made a lot of change in this country. You know, the things that I initiated when I was minister, you know, most of them have been abandoned. So what I'm saying is that uh, I'm not perfect, but in all my life, throughout my life, I have always thought about Ghana. Professor Frimpong Boateng still insists a field close to the president's Chebi residence was used for illegal mining activities. We vegetated the, that field. If we had planted cocoa, it would have been yielding fruits by now, after three, four years. So you might, you, you saw that you go there and you, you find pits, you know, freshly dug pits and gullies and so on. This happened four years ago. The place was uh, cleared, vegetated. And so what I'm saying is that it happened. So that's what I, I, I say for I now. I ask that because the traditional authorities sent journalists there to verify the claim.
and and and, and according to the according to the traditional authorities, there's no evidence that the president's garden was affected by illegal mining. I don't want to argue with them. If they say it wasn't affected, I'm saying that uh, we went there, you know, and did what we were supposed to do. And I don't know why we should even argue about this. It's not that we did this to to slice or somebody, but we were concerned that in a field near the president's house, somebody was doing something illegal. It okay. wasn't near the president's house, not his garden. No, I mean, a garden, I don't know what you mean. So, uh, it's not that uh, there's an, uh, a house world, there's a garden inside. And uh, No, I'm not talking about that kind of thing. So this is, this is, this is an area close to the president's house in Chibi. If, I don't know what you mean by close, but what I'm saying is that the field was there and the critical said they had enclosed on a, a little bit of the garden. So not, not in the house. So if you journalist, you were you the one who went there? No, I didn't go there, go but, house, but we had a reporter who went there as well. We went to a house. Were you, what were you, were you expecting to see? Gullies and, uh, and mountains and things like that. You know, four years. Leveled the place, vegetated the place. As I said, if I planted cocoa or even palm, you have been harvesting fruits. Well, joining me for a conversation on this is anti corruption campaigner Vita Sazim. Grateful for your time, sir. First, having followed how the Springpong Boateng Galamse report has been handled by government, what's your reaction to Professor Boateng's invitation by the OSP, which later became an arrest? The man says he feels victimized. Is it a case of people being victimized for exposing corrupt acts of government? Well, for now, it's difficult for us to just conclude that he's being victimized. They need to give us the evidence they have against him, which made them to arrest him. If, if that evidence is not convincing, then we could be saying that he's being victimized. But on, from, until that time, I think it's a bit difficult for us to just say he's being victimized. Well, shockingly, Professor Boatin doesn't believe the president is committed to fighting Galamse because of the approach he's deploying. And more damning, he says he doesn't think Galamse will end anytime soon. How does this come across to you? Well, that is a very sad uh, indictment of the president, especially with his commitment to fighting Galamse, which is also linked to his commitment to fighting corruption. You see, when you have somebody in charge of something, the fellow comes with a report. You need to take your time to read the, study the report, or at least refer to the appropriate institution to, to, to study it and tell, advise you. But for you to just conclude that, I mean, issue a statement that uh, it is, is unfounded, based on uh, unfounded allegations and all that, that already is an indication that you don't want to accept or you don't even want to consider the issues that the person has raised. Some of them may not be unfounded, but there may be some issues there that are verifiable. So you need to study before you conclude. And so if the president didn't do that, I just immediately just concluded that, well, there was nothing in this, and you dismiss it, followed by some of his people also dismissing it. It's difficult for anybody to, to say that he's committed to the fight against Galamse. Have we lost the fight against Galamse and, for that matter, corruption? Yes, I think the two are linked. The two are linked, and I would say that, yes, it appears, I think we've lost the fight against Galamse, both Galamse and corruption. And those are the issues that are contributing to our present economic crisis. And until we wake up to that realization, we don't have a way forward. But, but why so, uh, Ms. Azim? Well, there are a number of issues. One, the political leadership, as we have all both said, is not committed to it. Then, the rest of us, including those who are close to the president, who have, should be working to help the president to handle the situation, are also interested in their personal interests. 
And we as citizens, we are not contributing enough. We are not reporting these things. We are not demanding, like going into the streets and demand, demonstrating and demanding that the president does something about it. So there are three issues. The leadership itself, those in positions of trust or influential positions that are not supporting it, and then the rest of us Ghanaians. Then, of course, people give the, uh, the example, uh, the excuse of the high rate of unemployment in the country. The youth have nothing to do. But when they go to the side and come back, they have something in their pocket to spend. So it may not even be politically expedient for the government to try to, 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 to curb or curtail Galamse. Because you promise people jobs and you're not able to get them the job. So when they find something that they can do, it may be difficult for you to say that they shouldn't do it. So it is a, it's, it's a complex things that are cyclical. And then, of course, I've mentioned corruption. Also, first, Galamse. So it's not one thing that you can point to and say, this is why it's the situation like this. There are a number of issues surrounding it, and a number of actors that are involved. Or should have been acting, but they are not acting. What can we do, uh, Mr. Azim? It looks like every um, tactic we deploy fail, and it's actually with subsequent governments. What, what should we do right now? Well, see, first, we must back our, our ways with action. When you say you are fighting galaxy or fighting corruption, you must actually act to show that you are fighting galaxy and acting by arresting the people that are involved in it and penalizing them. Making Galamse unattractive to the ordinary, I mean, to the, the people that are involved by prosecuting, or at least recovering some of the assets that they have, they've acquired from the Galamse. When you do that, when people begin to see that you are serious about your, 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 your promise to fight Galamse, then they'll be a bit scared, and they will, they will, they will, they will, they will not want to continue in that practice. I'm grateful for your time. Vitas Azim is anti-corruption campaigner. He's been uh, speaking about Galamsey and corruption, and he says we, it's a collective responsibility. But first, the politicians must have the will to actually want to end it. Well, experts in the extractive industry are warning of grave consequences if Ghana goes ahead to extract bauxite in their Tiwa forest. It's been estimated that 1.7 trillion will be spent in 2023 alone on clean technologies due to the dramatic spike in demand for metals and minerals worldwide. This has raised concerns about among environmentalists, civil society and industry about the need Need to decarbonize the process for extraction. Co-chair of the Ghana Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, Dr. Steve Mantel, is warning any attempt by government to degrade the Etiwa forest will not augur well for the country. Between year 2000 and 2019, 3,264 kilometers square of forest was directly lost due to industrial mining, with 80% occurring in Ghana, Brazil, Indonesia, and Suriname. Ghana signed on to the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative in 2003 and is among 55 countries that have agreed to a common set of rules to promote good governance in the management of its natural resources. The Etiwa Range is a site of an important forest reserve and the source of three major rivers. It contains ancient bauxitic soils. Experts say there's enough bauxite in this uh, forest, but we must be cautious of the destruction that we can cause by thinking of uh, exploiting these uh, bauxite and other minerals in this forest. Etiwa has enormous resources that can generate revenues for the state. The medicinal plants, the water sources from here, a lot of the waters, rivers drain from uh, um, what do you call um, from from this forest. We are talking about the Dinsu, we are talking about Brim, we are talking about um, um, what do you call it, Ayensu. They all take their source from the forest. So if we are going to destroy this forest, 
that invariably is going to mean that we are destroying our water sources mm. and therefore quantifying what the effect will be downstream. Those of us who rely on these rivers for drinking water is, is, is just unthinkable. And so we need at all costs to be able to identify certain land areas in this country that are no-go areas for mining based on what purpose they serve and how they contribute to our own human development. In the middle of the Tiwa forest is the Supon River, which feeds into the Birim River, a key source of drinking water for the people in the eastern region. We are currently at the Supon River in the Etiwa forest. You can see how clean the water is, but if you move just a little further from here, you will see that the water has been destroyed and you cannot even think of drinking the water. Deputy National Director of Conservationist Group, Arocha Ghana, Darul Bosu says, the current high turbidity level of the river, which stands at 11.5 NTU, must prompt government to maintain its quality. Uh, most of these communities don't have access to pipe-borne water, so when these rivers flow out, that is where they fetch for their daily use and also for other domestic and industrial activities. And we believe that if we want to sustain the activities of communities and their livelihood and also their health, rivers like these, which is devoid of contamination, needs to be prioritized and protected. But what we have also seen is that you can't have clear rivers like these without forests. And that is why we believe that Atua, which, has, which is on record to be a critical hydrological gem for Ghana, must be protected in the long term because already, aside Sejimase, there are about 5 million other people who depend on rivers coming from the forest. And they go from uh, people in the city, in Accra, to central region, and even to the eastern region, and even connecting to River Pra, which serves people in the western region. So it's clearly an important ecosystem that we cannot allow anything to touch it. Now, if you step out of this forest, you realize that the rivers there are very, very polluted. And it's all because there's illegal activities going on there. Programs Officer West Africa at the Ford Foundation, Emmanuel Koyuli, says the next EITI conference scheduled for June 13 this year will deliberate on sanctioning member countries who disobey the rules on protecting their natural resources. I think it's important to include sanctions uh, in, into the process. Unfortunately, the EITI process, first of all, is voluntary, so it's not uh, uh, an initiative that um, can force governments to, to, to set. But it's important that once a, a, a country makes commitments, like Ghana and many other countries have made commitment to the process, that they include very stringent sanctions so that if you don't comply um, in ensuring that your communities are protected in this process, then you either are kicked out, not just being uh, kicked out from the EITR process, but other sanctions, including financial sanctions. There's no point if we move away from force, force fuels through a process that destroys forests. So the simple message is that leave the forest alone. The EITI standards advocates effective citizen participation. Mr. Koyeli says without such participation, there is a danger of serious environmental damage, corruption and social harm. Aisha Brime. Joy News, Etiwa Forest. Meanwhile, residents of Sejima Sen Chebi in the eastern region are recording strange diseases they suspect are being caused by illegal mining activities in the Etiwa Forest. The residents are angry about the destruction of their water bodies by illegal miners. Chief of the area, Berimo Koping Butu Dankwa I, wants his colleague chiefs to help the government end Galamse now. I visited the Sejimase community and here's what I found. You can see how destructive the land has become and you can see how cyanide has destroyed the water body. How the water...
uh, as assembly. Before we realized, all the excavators were gone. And the reason is that somebody comes in with a letter from the, the seat of government or from a powerful place. And then the MCE or whoever is in charge had nothing to do than to release them. Chief of the area, Berima Okopim Botu Dankwa I, is worried his people are not benefiting from the legal mining but are mostly affected in terms of health. Small diseases, rashes, even, even formerly, said in my community, you don't have mosquito there. Mosquito. But now, don't try. All because the trees and then uh, the lines, lines, they have destroyed everything. And it's very painful. It's very painful. And they don't know that the ancestors, it's true, it's a land God created. But I'm telling you, there's a spirit on it. Recently, a lot of people have died. Nicodemusly, then they pick the person and then bury him all. Of course, of course. The angry. CEO of the Center for Social Impact Studies, Richard Elema, says the country's biggest casualty ever has been that of our forest reserves. For him, sustainable mining and preventing the use of cyanide are key to dealing with the problems that confront us. Aishi Brian, Joy News, Etiwa Forest. Meanwhile, government says its objective for the Greening Ghana project has been effectively achieved as it reports that 70% of the trees planted survived. Deputy Minister for Lands and Natural Resources, Benito Usubio, was speaking during a visit to partners of the Green Ghana Day. More in this report. The Green Ghana Day was introduced in 2021 by President Nana Ekufuado as part of an aggressive national afforestation program to restore the lost forest cover of Ghana and to contribute to the global effort to mitigate climate change. In anticipation of this year's Green Ghana Day, Deputy Minister for Lands and Natural Resources Benito Ousubio is on a visit to partners of the Green Ghana Initiative to express gratitude for their continued support. In 2021, we started. Uh, we started with an initial uh, target of 5 million, and uh, at the close of the day, we were able to distribute, seven, uh, distribute and plant 7 million. Yes. And then the following year, too, uh, we set another target of 20 million. Uh, we did around 24 million. Yes. Uh, as we speak now, on the average, if you take the two years together, uh, the success rate or the survival rate of these seedlings uh, is pegged at around 70%. This has been through our own observation, monitoring exercises that we've done. And then finally, uh, one that has been done by national security on their own. They even didn't inform us that they were doing this, but they did it behind us. And then they brought us their report, which showed clearly that, yes, uh, these are the challenges and uh, this is where it's been successful. The group CEO for Guel PLC, Kwame Ose Prempe, one of the partners was full of praise for the initiative as he believes it will help deal with some of the country's environmental issues. This dream is a real good one, timelessly, and every Ghanaian ought to support it, especially corporate bodies. And we know that um, use of fossil fuels damage the environment. So the more trees we have, the better it is for us because some of the carbon can be absorbed and you can have some free air to breathe. So if we at God share your dream. That's what propelled us to bring that um, donation. But we do not believe that we are doing we did anything extraordinary because it's our duty to help Mother Ghana. Managing Director for Japan Motors, Abdul Somod Al Hassan Musa, said the initiative will play a significant role in reducing the impact of global warming. So, and then we also hope that with this uh, kind gesture we have done, the, the next time we are meeting, you give us a brief 
of the number of plants that we have uh, planted and which have survived. <laughs> so that we, we, have, we, look, we, we, we think that we actually our contribution will go a long way to improve the green uh, ideas that we all have. So this is a small thing that I want to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. The team also visited the Chamber of Mines where the CEO assured continual support for the initiative. The same way you mentioned that this is coming from the Honorable Minister for Lands and Natural Resources, I, I want to to be to be um, transparent here to say that we discuss the matter of Green Ghana at the highest level of the Ghana Chamber of Mines. And a decision was taken that we should continue to budget for Green Ghana going forward. So that committee it's always, it's always going to be there. It's going to be a part of us. This year's Green Ghana Day is scheduled for 7th of June with the goal of distributing a total of 10 million trees. Esther Nkrumah's report read to you. Here's a panny of the plastic waste of fuel in Ghana. Michael Kome of the KNUST Technology Consultancy Center, UNESCO Category 2 Center of Excellence, has been able to apply plastic waste in many sectors of the economy. As the world marks World Environment Week with plastic pollution in focus, we put a spotlight on how he's using plastic waste from the sea to improve soil fertility. Love FM's Kwesi Deborah has more for Thick Thursday. I first saw an article video of a lady, a lecturer uh, in India, who's making, uh, you know, turning passes to diesel um, fuel. And uh, at that time, she was earning like 20 million a year just by selling to, to Pragya. You know, India has a lot of Pragya, so that's that was what she was doing. So when I when I started my research, uh, you know, with the plastics, uh, no, no, with the with the um, water filter membranes, and then doing cook stores and all those things, this idea was lingering on. So what kickstarted the whole thing was more of out of annoyance of why Ghanaian scientists, researchers, professors are not able to solve the problem and we're, we're just talking about a problem and giving some interesting solutions which were for me so i started with um, um, a million team did a small part of some things and then that that, that 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 is what happened then of course you did your try and all there was a time i got funding and i had to tell the financiers that hold on let me understand get confidence in what and how and where the whole system works and then I can come for the money and then after I acquired all these things the funding didn't come because it's gone past that opportunity we, we, we had two drums of a desert petrol and then Ghana Climate Innovation Center bought these fuels and they use it in their car for their road show in 2015, 2018, thereabout. So we have a, a feedback report, written report from them. And um, uh, individuals have used it. Um, recently, our collaboration with Logon shows when you use a fuel, the, the petrol one, you use less gallons, like three and a half gallons to a craft. But if you are using the regular one, it's like four or five gallons. So, um, but then, you know, one went on and then came the circular economy. And then how do you use the, the whole value chain of the process of cleaning up plastics in the environment. And then we started looking at all these things. So we first did the, the fuel, diesel, petrol, gases. We did the, uh, how do we call it, the, um, the business models. Yeah, you make some money. Um, 
but then he thought it was incomplete. So we needed, we needed to make money from the char, and we needed, we needed to make money from the fuels as well. So we realized that char can be used for so many applications, water treatment, or as uh, this is for um, membrane development for water treatment for cleaning gases. Yeah. So that's a plastic from the sea. You know, I'm doing this in collaboration with um, Legon. Um, they also have something like Technology Consultancy Center. This is Institute of Applied Science and Technology. And so they brought me this sample from the sea. And uh, we are going, we are trying to paralyze it and then take the results for analysis. Uh, Yeah, when you increase the porosity, you are increasing the surface area by which uh, when anything comes into contact, if the gas comes into contact with the, the carbon and you have wider surface area at the nano level, um, it's more effective and reactive. This is cashew nut, so we are looking at all the farm waste. So this is cashew nut that has been charred. I'm using a huge power system powered by firewood. That's a raw um, cashew nut waste. And then this is a combination of coconut shell, rice hulks, corn cobs, name them, which we can further increase the porosity, porosity or pore sizes. Um, um, in salt. So this is charred already, so we just, we just want to increase the pore sizes or the surface area by doing it in salt. This is also, um, this, is, this one is mainly uh, plastics, including e-waste. Uh, we also pyrize e-waste, sieve it up, and then keep the metals on one side and then use the charred uh, plastics from the U waste. If we went to the north, they do farming. During the dry season, most of them are not farming because it's dry. When you mix this one with the soil, okay, it can absorb so much water and release them slowly to the plant. So within the dry season, you can still farm. So you can farm throughout the year by the application of this. We use this for stabilizing roads. It's when the road is clay, um, dry season, it cracks. Wet season, it expands. So your bitumen and your whatnot and whatnot doesn't last. We mix this with the soil, and it can absorb so much water and release the water slowly. So that expansion construction is you know, managed so that our bitumen or concrete or whatever we put on the surface of the uh, soil is stable. With state institutions failing to patch potholes, some residents of Borkrom in Kumase are filling up the holes with coconut husk. The residents say the poor nature of their roads is causing serious accidents. Nana Bwachi Adam exposes the hazardous road network for joining this Ghana Potholes exhibition. Government serving us, in fact, drivers here with the best. You get a cup and you say cheers. One road, several potholes. But some things need to be said and turn them. Can you let it out of the basket? A good number of roads in Ghana are left with dangerous potholes. Major road networks in Kumasi are no exception as the roads are inundated with deep secular depressions. Some motorists have experienced the damages that go beyond mechanical repairs in these craters. Before you can move straight from this particular stretch to wherever you are going, 
you must pass through this particular pit. The well-adorned road is now a death trap with praiseworthy traffic growth. Potholes have developed on this road. They refused to work on just this particular stretch. We've complained so much about the traffic over here. It is obvious that these potholes are fast developing into manholes, putting the lives of motorists and commuters at risk. But state institutions in charge of covering them up show up at work and do nothing about it. Several potholes, several potholes. One, two, three. Yes, sir. To some of these road users, this is a life threatening pit. Almost there three months, we were two accidents. Oh, I see. I came across an accident almost a month ago. As government institutions join on patching up the holes, some residents feel the riddled bitumen with debris to lessen the impact of vehicles slumping into holes. Sometimes they attempt to fill these holes with just anything. Sometimes with coconut husk. I started using this road around 1994. This is a busy road, but government isn't ready to fix it for us. We, the drivers, could fix it ourselves. This is very disheartening. The rains, however, washed away the debris, and with a few more slums into the small holes, the bitumen chips at the edges and become deep holes. As these potholes continue to widen, water seeps into the weakened underlying soil as the heavy vehicular load fatigue the poorly asphalted surface. So just as government says it deserves credit for free senior high school, one district, one factory, planting for food and jobs, one village, and one dam, I think government also deserves some credit for this one. To some of these road users, up until something happens, nothing will be done about this. Reporting for Joy News, my name is Nana Bwache Dankwayadom. Selinda so Ashanti region, the urban roads department in that region says work on the Swami interchange have already commenced. This comes after intensified calls by residents and road users for the project from the residents of Ashanti region. The project managers say preliminary designs have been submitted to a review while diversion roads are under construction. Nanai Aljima joined a team from the Ashanti region coordinating council to visit the site and has filed this report. Consultants and clients have already reviewed the preliminary design of the interchange project with the contractors making the necessary changes. Per the contract, the design is to be completed by August 2023. Project manager at Rango Construction, Mohamed Omar Fazani, says they are ahead of the design schedule. We already submit the preliminary design and we receive some comments from the consultant and the owner. And according to the contract, must be let them change what they ask us to change in the primary design uh, report. So I think during the next month or one and a half month, we finish all the design stage and go to the ground to start. But uh, we are ahead of our schedule, ahead of the, the, the design schedule. The camp site for the construction staff is 85% complete. In October 2022, President Akufuado cut sword for construction works to begin on the Swami Interchange Project. The four-tier interchange project, including five overpasses, is to be constructed in two phases within 30 months. It will also result in the widening of sections of the road and improvement in selected roads in the catchment. Francis Gambra is Ashanti Regional Director of Urban Roads. The fiscal was expected to take off by August. And also, also as the project manager informed us, we are likely even to be ahead of schedule and start the fiscal work by July. I mean, that is in one month's time. Meanwhile, Regional Minister 
Simon Osemensa assured diversion roads are being constructed ahead of the main works. <laughs> There are some local roads that have to be constructed so they can divert the road. The Swami Road is a very busy one. Imagine closing one side of the road for all vehicles to use the other. The traffic will be serious, so the local roads will have to be fixed to ease the traffic. For Joy News, Nanaya Ojima, Kumasi. The issue of discrimination against women has been on the front burner for decades, with many vigorous advocates to clamp down on the menace. In today's edition of Joy News' Remembrance Series on Professor Amate Du, we bring you extracts from her piece, An Angry Letter in January, a creative masterpiece which speaks vehemently against discrimination, racism and inequality at large, read by ace Ghanaian filmmaker Akofa Ejiani. I'm at this an angry letter in January. Dear bank manager, I've received your letter. Thank you very much. Threats, intimidations and all. So what if you won't give me a loan of 2000 Or only conditioned by special rules and regulations? Because I'm not white, male or a commercial farmer, in relation to the latter, whose land is this anyway? I know that for what I'm not, you could have signed away two solid millions and not too many questions asked. Of course I'm angry. Wouldn't you be if you were me? Reading what you had written was enough to spoil for me all remaining 11 months of the year plus a half. But I won't let it. I had even thought of asking God that the next time round, he makes me white, male, and a commercial farmer. But I won't. Since apart from the great poverty and the petty discrimination, I have been very happy being me, an African, a woman, and a writer. Just take your racism, your sexism, and your pragmatism off me. Overt, covert, or internalized. And damn you. We're still live on Joy News Desk. We'll take a break. When we return, we'll bring you business. Joining us for business, my name is Daryl Kwao. The Ghana Oil Company Limited, Guao, has improved its performance in 2022 by registering a profit after tax of 123.9 million cities. This is 26% higher than what was recorded in 2021. In view of this, the company declared a dividend of 0.056 pesos per share for the 2022 financial year. The board chairman of the company, Reginald Daniel Lai, said Guao will enhance its operations and systems to provide quality products and services. He spoke at the 54th annual general meeting of the oil fair. The company said it continued to dominate the bankering market in Ghana, increasing its market share from 60% in 2021 to 73% in 2022. Board chair for the company, Daniel Lai, reiterated the company's commitment to continue providing valuable products and services to its stakeholders and also implement programs to maintain its position as the leading oil marketing company in the country. We are proud to announce that Goyle, as a group, made a net profit after tax of 123.89 million 
in the year 2022, up by 26% compared to the previous year. Earnings per share rose to 0.316 in 2022 compared to the year 2021, which was 0.252. We are happy to declare a dividend of 0.056 to our cherished shareholders, up by 19% compared to the year 2021. Group Chief Executive Officer Kwame Ose Prempe said, the company leveraged technology to improve on its cash collection methods through the use of cashless system by its customers to purchase items at its service station and other outlets. Our plan is to move ahead and move ahead. As of last year, we had about 15 point something percent of the market. 2022, we had, um, we reached over 20% of the market. This year, we want to go higher. Um, we believe that the public is understanding us that we have the best of fuel, especially when it comes to petrol, the around 95 is the best at the best price, very competitive price. So um, we are expanding. As at now, over the past one year, we've added more than almost 40 stations to our, our numbers and we are, we are still doing more. We want to get to everywhere. And uh, because once the public realize that we are the best, they will come to us. The recent challenges that we had has shown us that Ghanaians have really embraced our raw 95. Goyal said fuel sales grew up by 21.4% during the year 2022. James Eshens reports for Joy Business. Now, the Driver and Vehicle Licensing Authority, DVLA, in partnership with Ghana Post Company Limited, has launched a system to deliver driver's licenses to clients at the comfort of their homes, offices, and other locations of choice. Speaking at the launch, Chief Executive Officer Kwesi Ajiman Buzia revealed that the service was instituted with a customer-centric approach, hence a flat rate of 30 cities per delivery across the country. Here's more in this report. The Driver and Vehicle Licensing Authority, as part of efforts to contribute to the digitalization agenda, has launched a delivery service. The delivery, which will be run by the Ghana Post, seeks to clear 80,000 uncollected cards, prevent congestion at DVLA offices, and increase compliance by clients, among others. Kwesi Ajimambuzia is Chief Officer of DVLA. For over 20 years, has provided a framework for more effective administration of driver licensing and vehicle registration. The recent growth of DVLA's consumer base has made it necessary to deliver driver licenses to our clients. The foundation of our strategy plan pivots on the atmosphere of peace. This association with assisted government institution where core competency in package delivery and nationwide distribution apparatus Augmented by digitization is therefore obvious, is needful, is necessary. Managing Director of Ghana that the country's global positioning system infrastructure is of high quality. He says his outfit is therefore equipped to deliver the task. It does not matter where you are in Ghana. DVLA would process your license and Ghana Post will deliver that license to you. Fellow Ghanaians, can we know that the stress is less? It is only 30 Ghana cities. Imagine you are you process your license and even even in Accra, let, let me not go far, you are in Kaswa and you come to process it at the head office. Now even if you take truck truck, Kaswa in and out, that 30 Ghana, you will lose time, you will lose money. Give that money to DVLA and Ghana Post so that we will save you time and the convenience to receive your license at home. Both institutions emphasized the need to foster public-public partnerships. And that's all in business. Thanks for watching.
that we wrap up a joy news desk this morning my name is Aisha Brian thanks so much for watching log on to myjohnline.com there's more of the news and updates of all the developing stories see you again at 12.